Lessons of life is coming down from above to lay down where you lie. Time will lose its weight on you. Dark, 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 dark sky. Darkening skies. We're on the 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 darkening skies. Yo, yo, you ready for this? Coming at you from Wicked Big Studios in Peabody, Massachusetts. Ladies and gentlemen, sit back, buckle up, because you're in the happy hour with your boy.
What's up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the happy hour, guys. I apologize for the one-week hiatus. I just want to let everybody know we had a fantastic time out in Las Vegas, Nevada, guys. It was awesome. Thank you to everybody who come out to visit us at Circus Sports, also over at uh, Budweiser Beer Park, guys. It was fantastic. I appreciate everyone. Hope you enjoy the swag, and uh, we'll be seeing you real soon back out there in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, guys. I, I can't tell you guys you made it feel like home away from home. Thanks to everybody, Billy the Bear Guy in Vegas, everybody else who come out there and uh, took a great care of us, our friends at the Nevada Beverage Company. Uh, guys, everybody was awesome. Also, the, our friends over at the Mob Museum, thanks for hosting us on Friday night. Um, quick uh, housekeeping notes just to let everybody know, yes, while I was gone, we did have the packages made, everything shipping out. We do have more 4 in one <coughs> koozies being ordered, guys. Please do me a favor. Make sure you keep hitting up Big D. He's going to be mailing those out this week, guys. Our packages and our swag are still shipping even though I was out of the uh, state. Also, being brought to you today by Black Blender's Eyewear, ladies and gentlemen. Blender's Eyewear is the official eyewear provider of the Happy Hour Social Club. You guys know you can always save 15% with promo code KINGHAP. Ski goggles, everything over there. Make sure you get yourself over there. And, of course, MLO Shoes, ladies and gentlemen. I can't thank them enough. Everybody was commenting on my shoes out in Las Vegas. What a great time we had. Uh, guys, thank you so much. You guys want to get your hands on some uh, MLO Shoes right now. They got a sale going on. The only promo code that works on top of the sale prices, promo code KINGHAP. Save an additional 10% off the 50% off sale that's going on right now. Ladies and gentlemen, while I flew to Las Vegas, Nevada, and I'm not going to lie, I polished it off on the way back. I had the honor of reading a fantastic book, and I said I need, need to get this man on the show for the Happy Hour Social Club listeners. Uh, guys, when I tell you, am I honored? I'm talking Boston media legend ladies and gentlemen please welcome the i mean uh, the author of a fantastic new book that's dropping today the day of his drop he's here with you guys on the happy hour guys life without life with the larry bird celtics wish it lasted forever dan shaughnessy welcome to the show big man Hey, it's great to be here, Mike. How you doing? Oh, I'm fantastic, man. I, I'm very excited to have you on. The book is amazing. And I'll tell you, I mean, truthfully, I, I, I want to take a brief moment here now that we're on the air. I know that we spoke off the air a little bit, but now that we're on the air, I want to thank you because going into, you know, going into communications and everything, I mean, truthfully, I mean, you were, uh, you know, as I, you know, as I came up and I seen all your accolades and I mean, geez, you were everywhere in the Boston sports scene. And I mean, you were a big influence on me. So personally for me to you, before we get going, I wanted to give you a sincere thank you well i appreciate that it means a lot to have the local people come up into the business and uh I, we had good role models growing up here and I, i'm glad i was i was one that you could uh, kind of enjoy as you were as you were developing into what you've become <laughs> i appreciate that i mean i mean born in groton mass i mean you're right here one of us you know what i mean hometown and i'll tell you a hey, being you being you and i mean coming up in in massachusetts i know that actually when you got your start you started out out in baltimore right i mean the first team you covered was the baltimore orioles but then coming back to boston that must have been like a dream come true to you yeah, it was. I mean, you know, I grew up in Central Mass. It was very small there. And then, you know, when I was at Holy Cross, I was able to do a, work for the Globe as a stringer and get to do some stories from Worcester. And, and then they let me do high schools around Massachusetts. So I got pretty familiar with all the East Mass high school rankings and the leagues and whatnot. And I uh, did that for four years part time. And then, when, yeah, left to go to Baltimore where when I was 23, uh, I was covering the Orioles for the Baltimore Evening Sun and then for the Washington Star. And all those papers went out of business in uh, 1981. I uh, had a chance to come back to the Globe as a full timer, and uh, that's basically just before my cover in the Celtics started. So I come back here in '81, and I'm like 26 years old, whatever. And and then uh, Bob Ryan left the Celtic beat to go to television on Channel Five, and they, they they needed a basketball guy. And I had done five years of Major League Baseball, and I liked basketball a lot, knew a lot. And of course I walked into, you know, the greatest beat of all time covering the Larry Bird Celtics. And it was very different in those days as you, as you see in this book, because we really, it was very, uh, I don't know, primitive and, and close. We, we, we were with them. We traveled with them. We flew commercial, rode the buses, went to practice, stayed in the hotels. 
drank in the bars. It was like being on the team, except not having the groupies or the fame or the money. But other than that, <laughs> we were just like them. Yep. And one of the things I noticed about this book, Big Man, is this is honestly, I mean, for you Back to the Future fans, you pick up this book and it's like you get in a time <laughs> machine and you go back to a time where basketball was just amazing. And I know a lot of, and I mean, from my, my uh, Wednesday night and Thursday night shows, you know, everybody, a lot of really big basketball fans. I mean, truthfully, this took you back to it. This takes you back to a time where basketball was just an absolute art. I mean, one of the things I seen in, in, as you started, the, you know, at the very, towards the beginning of the book, I don't want to give away too much of it, but you talk about Bill Russell in there and Bill Russell used to come out and this man would block multiple shots a game. And, and it was like his goal was to block the shot, control the ball, and then start the offensive, you know, go down the other end and start the offensive set. Whereas now... Everybody wants to send it as far as they can, four or five rows deep, right? I mean, there's a big difference these days. Yeah, they're trying to impress the girls and get on ESPN and have the highlight, all that jazz. But Russell just wanted to win the game, and uh, he would control the block or do it softly so he'd get it to a teammate or, or catch it himself after blocking it and then start the fast break down the other floor, catch them sleeping, and, and get easy baskets at the other end. So he was he was revolutionary, and, and you know, I grew up at a time where, man, I – I was in like high school before I realized that the Celtics don't win the championship automatically every, every <laughs> spring. Cause it just every, every spring of my youth as, as a fan and they won eight in a row, they won 11 out of 13. And it was just something that happened every year. It didn't spoil us. And the team didn't have the popularity that it got 15 years later when, when Larry and Parrish and DJ and Max and Mikhail and those guys came in that, that they were, they were so hot then I mean, you're kind of young for this, but the Bruins had this kind of domination of the market with Bobby Orr in the 70s, and then the, the Celtics did it through the 80s, and like the Patriots have now, when when Tom was here, certainly, where it just that's always the conversation and always a sellout and just possible to get tickets. And the Celtics were that item in Boston, in New England, in the 80s. And, you know, watching The Last Dance, uh, you know, the pandemic kind of inspired this book a little bit because, you know, with the beginning of the pandemic, you know, the, the last dance was on every Sunday night and I'm watching that great fall from the eighties and nineties. And, yes. and then around here that, you know, Comcast and Neston, they were all you know showing old Celtic games from the eighties and, and ESPN 30 for thirties on Celtics Lakers. And I'd see my goofy looking 28 year old self sitting there with the giant <laughs> Michael Caine glasses. And, uh, and we were sitting right on the bench, basically we're just right next to them. Those seats are now sold for thousands but in that time, they gave the media, right? We were there, so we could hear everything. And, and uh, just seeing that and seeing the way they played, it, it just struck me as, man, that was a special time. I've been telling those stories in bars for the last 40 years. So so I like your time machine. I'm going to use that in all my interviews now. That's a good one, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> I, honestly, as I read it, that's what I thought about. And one of the things, you know, it's, you say that about that. I mean, that just shows you what a different time we're in. I mean, I've been, uh, I've been a Celtic season. I was a Celtic season ticket holder 14 years now. And um, what I did was I've been trying, for the last probably six, I was trying to get to the uh, to the black seats. And, and you know, <laughs> it's, been without, it's been without success, clearly. But um, yeah, one yeah, of the yeah. things is those you to be given to media i mean my how times have changed that those are the most sought after seats and they used to be the ones that they would be given with the uh media passes that's incredible just to think about right i know i think like the lakers and the knicks figured it out first because you know they'd have like that whole jack nicholson thing that was happening there were a few fan seats and they had you know it was kind of a place to be seen you'd have dustin hoffman or now it's dicaprio and those guys but you know and, and they would pay anything to be there and it was like well screw the media. We don't need these guys down there. We can kick them upstairs. And, and they did. And I understand that because there's so much money to be made down the court. So why, why give it away to the lowly medias who, you know, don't really matter that much. I understand that, but just luckily for me, I was doing it at a time when they still valued the, the daily print guys and, and they hadn't figured out all the money that was in those sideline seats. And, and there we were basically right next to the bench. You could hear stuff and, you know, guys would you know, when they inbounded, they were like sweating on you. I mean, it was really cool. Yeah, that is that, that's pretty amazing. I've I've been lucky enough to sit in those seats a couple of times, and I'll tell you, every time I did, I I thought to myself, man, I need this for you know night in night out for the games I do attend. Uh, and like I said, I'm still swinging for the fence on those. We'll see if it happens. But one of the funnier things here that I was gonna I was gonna mention is before you actually became the Celtics beat writer, right? About f about six months before that, you actually anchored a five part series on the NBA and the struggles they were having, right? I mean. It, what, what, if I'm wrong, 17 out of 23 teams lost money in 1982. 
Well, you did read this book. That's good reading comprehension 101 there, Mike. That's uh, that's good because that's that's in the early part of the book. And yes, uh, the you know, the NBA at the time, you know, there was it was a fledgling league. That's when the the finals were on tape delay. They weren't broadcast live, and and the league attendance was down. There was a big drug problem throughout the league, and and there was a notion, oh, the league's too black, and people aren't going to like that. And there was all kinds of nonsense going on, and uh, they were scuffling. And that's true about the 17 out of 23 then teams to losing cash. And at the time, uh, the commission was Larry O'Brien, the former political operative under John F. Kennedy. His assistant was David Stern. And when he, he got wind of uh, the series we were doing, Stern came to Boston and we had a momentous uh, meeting with him. And, and that's where we all got to know David Stern. We figured he was just a bean counter from New York and he ended up being the most powerful commissioner since Pete Rozelle. I mean, he, the league just thrived under him. And, you know, of course, they had Larry and Magic and Michael. All, all coming into their greatness at that time. And Stern knew how to exploit that, how to globalize the game, television, marketing, you know, product, trademarks, all that stuff. And, and the league really, that's why those salaries are what they are now, and that's why the tickets are what they are now. Yep, I mean, it exploded under David Stern. I mean, I'm not going to lie. One, David Stern, in his um, towards the end, his he had a little bit of a smug attitude, and I wasn't yeah. really keen on, you know, the way he um, addressed the media and, you know, in interviews. He could really, you know, he, basically, I mean, the guy wrote his own ticket regardless, but my, my thoughts on him was at the end, I could tell he'd kind of had enough. I mean, but when you first met him at the beginning, was D- David Stern probably had to be a much different character than he was towards the end of his uh, reign, correct? Well, you, you always knew he was the smartest guy in the room and he was and that was okay with me um but he didn't have the, the gravitas that he had later because his league was kind of scuffling i mean they were getting beat by indoor soccer with tv ratings and like that so he couldn't he couldn't peacock around too much at that stage of his career and you know i remember well, the first all-star game when he became commissioner i was having a beer with mikhail and and the commissioner sat down and we were like oh this is really cool the new commissioner sitting here he's only like 42 years old at the time and and, you know, Kevin had had a couple of, he knocked a beer on him into his lap and, <laughs> and the commissioner was pretty good. He didn't make a scene. He just ordered another, another pitcher. And, and we kind of went from there and I'm thinking, okay, we can deal with this guy. And, and, uh, you were right in your assessment. It did, you know, it got so big and it was so successful and, you know, the dream team and the globalization oh, yeah. and trips to Europe and all that. He, he got a little pull of himself at the end, but he probably stepped down at the right time. Yeah, I was thinking that because, you know, now you see there's some other stuff going on with the NBA, and that has to do with, like, the way that it plays. And I'll touch on that in a little bit. But before we get off David Stern, one thing you said that they were losing to indoor soccer and things like this. Now, here's a question for you. I I mean, one of the things that I did read in your book is that the NBA actually would go ahead and delay their season, not to make sure that they didn't match up with MLB playoffs, World Series, et cetera, and other sports. That's something that is almost unheard of these days. I mean, that's something that actually took place back then. I was unaware yeah that's a comment of really as much as about how baseball has fallen with the population especially the young people and and just not a hot item and you know kind of the purview of the oldies and i'm one of them but yeah in those days the world series was still a big deal i think the 86 world series like i think it was is like five times as many people watched it then as, as do now and oh. that's sort of what you're looking at so they would they would they would delay their season or postpone or do what they had to do to make sure that they weren't matched up with with the mid-October then World Series games that were going on. And now, of course, the whole motivation for all the sports is to stay the hell away from the NFL. You don't want to play a Thursday night baseball game or Monday night baseball game or Sunday night baseball oh, game because yeah. you're just going to get annihilated in the ratings by that football. It's funny because we have uh, we have the we have Red Sox tickets as well. And once the end, once the NFL season starts, you could have a Sunday night Yankee game. It doesn't matter who came to town. I mean, it could be the Column Globetrotters for God's sake. And it means nothing who they're playing. Nobody's interested in going to those games because they'd rather stay home and watch the game. But where Cleveland versus Cincinnati, it doesn't matter what teams are playing. <laughs> People want to sit home, watch the NFL, and baseball takes a backseat every Sunday night. I know that. And then a lot of times, all day Sunday. I mean, Sunday baseball is enormous right till the NFL starts. No? Am I wrong? <laughs> no, that's all true. I mean, the NFL, the betting and the fantasy, you just can't compete with that. You know, I mean, you know, not to mention the violence and the action and and it's, it's and you see everything on football and TV. I mean, the, the the field is the same size as a TV. It's a rectangular field, and you can get the whole deal. Where in baseball, you know, you don't know what the hell is going on in the right field corner or here or there. You don't see the whole field the way you do. Football is just perfect for television in every way. 
Yep, and it, the, the footage is excellent. And and what's funny is when this book starts off, the Patriots, the the Sox, the Bruins, they were all terrible. And basically, the only <laughs> the only ticket in town was the was the Celtics. I mean, the the Red Sox. You know, they were having you know, of course, the the curse of the Bambino, which you've written on yep. on multiple yep. occasions. And uh, you know, it, we as it went, I mean, this the eight the eighties belong to Larry Bird, the Chief, and Kevin McHale. No. No question. I mean, we had this championship drought everywhere else. I mean, the Sox obviously were working on an 86 year drought, and Patriots had never won anything. They they'd gotten to the finals or to the final game a couple of times. They got spanked, and uh, the Bruins were a little bit of a lull. They were always in the playoffs, mostly getting eliminated by the Canadians every year. And, yep. But their their last cup was '72. So yeah, you kind of got this drought going. The Celtics keep they they, they keep in the game. With, they're winning with Collins and JoJo White and Havlicek, and they. They win a couple in the 70s, and then, of course, Bird gets here in 81, and and they win three championships in the 80s, and they're in the finals four straight years, you know, against the Lakers three of those years. So it just took off, and, and they were they were the bomb. They were it. Yep, and I'll tell you, you earlier on, right, We and this is something I wanted to bring up on definitely on this interview because I, I, I read it in your book, and this is one of my favorite things in, like, right now when we compare. I sit down my co-host, Taco, Beantown, everybody, when we're chatting, right? I say, that, you know, we always talk about the NBA, and, you know, basically LeBron James takes a jump shot from the free throw line. He gets defended, <laughs> his fingertips get touched, he falls down like he's been shot out of the balcony, you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's actually kind of atrocious but uh, we mentioned Kevin McHale earlier Kevin McHale's legendary foul on Kurt Rambis right mm-hmm. I know in the book uh, mm-hmm. Kevin jo- and I don't want to give away too much of the book big man but Kevin jokes in the book that he would have been suspended for at least a year and I agree with oh, him yeah. oh he'd have Absolutely. been a- that was a personal foul he got two shots and McHale didn't even go, f- go, go get a breather Forget- no. I- if that foul ever happened now <laughs> I-, I think he'd leave in handcuffs I mean you can't yeah. expect they would leave allow him to stay in the game no no i mean at that time like you say you know rambis got to the line for two made one out of two celtics inbounded that was the end of it no technical no nothing you know and no no possession no flagrant plus one and no nothing and no suspension obviously uh the lakers they were they were mad about it and um you know there was a scrum afterwards and nobody was was thrown out at all and then there was more stuff going on the rest of that game and you know, mikhail at the end of this book talks about you know because the 86 team a lot of us contend it's still the greatest NBA team of all time. And, and it translates into today is because they were so big and they played inside out and they just, they had shooters and, and they, they were rugged. But Mikhail, when, when that question is posed to him, he just says, Hey, if you let us play the, by the rules that we played by, I'll take us against anybody. He says, by today's rules, We'd all foul out in the first quarter. I was going to say, Larry Bird especially. I mean, how many technicals would Larry Bird get these days just with the <laughs> trash talk? And, I mean, he'd whisper something and everyone's able to walk by him. And, and, you know, the ref hears that. You get you, know, you get teed up and tossed now. Back then, forget about it, man. That, those games, I mean, the, the Pistons were legendary for physical play. Okay. And then uh, in the 90s, you had those Nick teams with Charles Oakley, Anthony Mason. I mean, truthfully, there were some teams that, I mean, just had it and played physical and, yeah had to call the game because of that because if not you were getting you weren't even going to have any viewers by the end of the game because you'd have the end of the bench playing because everybody would have fouled out i mean truth be told those days i don't get me wrong it was probably a lot more injuries a lot more play of players playing with injuries but i enjoyed that physical style of play i mean i found that a tremendous watch especially the old school celtics i mean larry um larry and uh the chief the chief with his uh, throwing his punches and stuff those days were amazing they really were yeah i mean and that a lot of that did come out and sort of sparked me to write the book because we're watching those those they were there were no games to watch at the beginning of the pandemic you know so every night like highlight reels of, of old games and the best games they could find, of course, were the, the ones you were talking about. And you'd, you know, you'd watch the Celtics and Sixers in you know, Game 7, and just a bloodbath. And the same with the Pistons, same with the Knicks. And and it was like, man, that was a different time. And wasn't that much more fun and just a better product? And oh. I don't know. I mean, there was it, on every level, it was just it was just more fun. And I had to be careful promoting this book, not to just keep saying, yeah, well, the league was great then, and it sucks now, and that's why you need to buy this book, you know, because I don't want to offend the NBA. That's not a good uh, party starter for them, but there is a grain of that to, to what, what the purpose of it is and why it's, why it's just fun looking back these days. 
a th- you know, and there was some throwback. There's been some throwback plays late, you know, uh, you know, you know, recently we've had some throwback plays, even they, you know, visited by, I mean, KG, I know that uh, we spoke about Kevin McHale a little earlier. Kevin McHale, actually, I had the pleasure of meeting Kevin one time, and I'll tell you what, he seemed like an amazing guy. It was brief, and I didn't, you know, I didn't have a, an opportunity to sit down and drink beers with him, but Kevin McHale must have been an amazing guy, and I know that Celtics fans to this day still thank him not only for his play here, but that amazing KG trade. He seemed like such a great guy. I mean, if you had to give me a description of Kevin McHale, one of my all-time favorite players, how would you describe Kev? Well, I mean, he's like guys we grew up with. He was very um, grounded. He never, first of all, his his size was sort of a, he was like a genetic mutant. I mean, no one in his family was like that. He was he was like six foot ten with the arms of a seven footer. And But his, you know, his brother was like a normal 5'11 guy and his dad was a little shorter than that. And they weren't big people. So, it just sort of happened. And of course he's from the iron range in Minnesota, which is way the hell North of Minneapolis. And everybody's hockey up there. That's all they got. Yep. And, uh, then the goal, if you're going to play in college is to play at the U, which is in, in Minneapolis, the university of Minnesota, the Gophers. And so he was able to achieve those things, but he never, he never made basketball his life. He didn't, you know, he married a girl from high school and, and, uh, and then they just, they, they had five kids and, and he was all about that. And, and he was the kind of guy he'd, you know, try to make you comfortable and he had a lot of humor and, and, uh, it couldn't, he couldn't believe the money himself. Cause his dad was, they were all miners. His whole family was, was in the, in the mines up in the Northern, Northern range. And so he, he just was like, oh, they're going to pay me more in a year than my dad and all of his uncles made in the whole lives. And he, he understood that he valued that he didn't take for granted and, and, um, and it just was, he was easy to be around. He was very funny. He was quick with the quips and, and, uh, you know, didn't take it too seriously. And I think that was, and, and he was so great, a little bit underrated as a, as a great player because his drop step and his, his up and under move. And they, they often thought he was traveling because it didn't seem possible that he could get, get free the way he did. And the our long arms helped a lot. And, you know, he and Larry weren't like close, close. There was a little bit of a Ruth Gehrig thing going on there yeah. where people thought they must be besties because they're both white guys from the Midwest playing on this great Celtic team. But they uh, they were different. Larry took the losses much harder than, than Kevin did. And it bothered it bothered the Larry that Kev didn't take him harder. And, and you know, Kev wouldn't, wouldn't hit the floor the way Larry would. You know, he's a little careful about that. A lot of tall people don't particularly enjoy doing that. And I, I sort of understand that because they're getting banged up enough down there and oh yeah and kevin was just uh kind of a happy-go-lucky guy and, and just a joy to be around and he was very he would try to make you comfortable whereas larry i didn't trust strangers and, and would just you know make you feel uncomfortable until you got to know him that's just they had different personalities yeah um and, and the other thing is like i said a little, a little while ago the boston fans in the the younger generations of uh they think that kevin McHale's greatest contribution to uh boston you know celtics basketball was the kevin garnett trade which it wasn't <laughs> but i'll tell you what man K- kg coming here for those years was one of the best throwbacks we ever seen and i know now um kendrick perkins has become a a really big person in the local you know media but he's good oh yeah. he's excellent but one of the things that you could you'd have to say is playing next to Kevin Garnett after Kevin Garnett and Kendrick Perkins was split up he was never the same player but that intensity with that I mean with that big body and that toughness the intensity yeah. that he instilled in Kendrick Perkins was downright scary in Boston was that not yeah Perk was the perfect you know fifth, fifth guy for that team didn't need the touches you know could do the do the dirty work down there him getting hurt you know cost him a championship in my view and you know, he had a lot of skill at, at the other positions, but Garnett was the one to bring the intensity. And you know, he'd do that thing when you know the whistle blows and the guy take a shot anyway. And you know, Garnett would always make sure that ball didn't reach the hoop. He'd just go up and just just grab it, so that oh, yeah. you know it was sort of a throw down, like sending a message here. You're not going to practice shooting on our watch here, and and uh, just had that whole intensity. And yeah, the McHale, the Genesis. I remember you know Danny Ainge. You know, Red used to tease Danny about the whole Mormon thing and be like, you know, how many wives you got, and just teasing him about all the. <laughs> mythology of Mormons and, and Danny play he'd play poker with uh, Bird and McHale and, and Red say, Hey Danny, I thought that was against the rules too. What's what's with the what's with the gambling? And Danny'd point to McHale and say, Well, it's not even gambling against this guy and uh and then lo and behold, you know, years later the two of them make a deal where Danny gets his one ring as a G as a GM 
because Kevin, you know, had to trade Garnett and, and helped his friend get Garnett. And, you know, I mean, you got Al Jefferson. He didn't really get a big yield for that, but he, they had to move him. And it worked out great for Boston. And, you know, Garnett's going to get his number retired and all those good things. So, yeah, it's uh, it's it's funny how it it's you know generation later uh, the whole mentality of McHale came back to help Boston again. Definitely, and you know it, it it did come full circle with that. You mentioned Danny Age. I'm going to ask you a question about that. What we're going to do, guys? We're going to take a quick break here, and we're going to be back. Uh, and I mean, uh, we got so much to touch on here with Dan. Dan, we appreciate your time. What we're going to do, guys? We're going to have a, a brief message from one of our very favorite sponsors, guys. We'll be right back after this brief word from one of the lovely ladies of the Happy Hour. It's a top selector. Ta 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 Hey guys, today's episode of the Happy Hour is brought to you by Liquid IV. Liquid IV is the world's greatest hydration drink, and the best part is, it's good for you. Liquid IV is taking care of the Happy Hour Social Club members with 25% off. Guys, that is a great deal. Promo code KINGHAP will save you 25%. They have great all-new flavors like guava, apple pie, watermelon, pina colada, strawberry, and the new Happy Hour-inspired tangerine. All these flavors are refreshing and delicious. Promo code King Hap will save you 25%. And speaking of refreshing and delicious, back to your host of the happy hour, King Hap. Oh, yeah, ladies and gentlemen. The lovely ladies of the happy hour bringing you good times and great deals. I'll tell you, Liquid IV has been with us for so long. One of my very favorite sponsors. They took such great care of me in Las Vegas. And I'll tell you what, they made the tangerine flavor just for us with the added vitamin C. I tell you what, I feel fantastic coming off the plane. I made sure I drank my vitamin C Liquid IV on the plane. And when any time I had too many adult beverages down in Vegas, I stayed well hydrated. Promo code King app. Save yourself 25%, ladies and gentlemen. Guys. We are here with Boston media legend Dan Shaughnessy. Dan, I gotta, I gotta, I'd be, I'd honestly, I'd be kicking myself if I didn't bring this up. I mean, 2016, you you receive the uh, JG Taylor Spink Award for the a Career Excellence Award at the Hall of Fame. I mean, that must have been absolutely. I mean, truthfully, you earned the award, big dog. But you tell me this. That must have been an absolute highlight to your career. That is an amazing accomplishment. Well, thank you. Thanks, Mike. I mean, professionally, that's as good as it gets. And, you know, and we we all get a little full of ourselves and, and whatever. This isn't, you know, brain surgery here. and we're, we're just having fun. And we're lucky we have passionate fans and great readers who enjoy this stuff. And we have great teams and people to write about. So there's no better place to do what I do in Boston just because you know the success of the teams the passion and smartness of the fans it's just it's the best place to do it so that said then you get you get the Hall of Fame acknowledging you know there's one writer a year gets that thing in, in Cooperstown and and it I, it just took my breath away it still does to go there you know your family gets to go and you get to stay at the Otisaga Hotel with all the Hall of Famers and then you have to give a speech and the Hall of Famers are sitting right there on the on the stage you got Willie Mays and Sandy Koufax and they're listening to you. It's it's very intimidating uh, moment, and you don't want to be bad, and you got to practice and just and be fast and get the hell out of there so they can all get to the bar and all that stuff. But it, it's 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 pressure. But you know, you, then you got this lovely award. You can look after the rest of your life, and you know, when you're dead, you know, your children and grandchildren go to Cooperstown, and and you're on the wall there. And it's just, it's kind of a cool thing. I mean, I, I got to say, I, you know, it's it's thanks for mentioning it and it was five years ago and, and it, it, I still get a, a real thrill just thinking about it. It was a great honor. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I remember when you, the year that you got it was, that was, if I'm not mistaken, that was the uh, Ken Griffey Jr. Mike Piazza year. Am I right? Correct. You got a good memory. Exactly. Yes. I, I was thinking you know. about that. And uh, the, one of the reasons I remember it is old friend, uh, Jeff Bagwell missed by a whisker that year. Right? Yeah. I remember yeah. that he, uh, I was never really a big Jeff Bagwell fan knowing that he could have been a lifelong Red Sox and still be <laughs> traded him away for Larry Anderson and yes, the rest did. is history. My goodness. One of the other things is Jeff Bagwell was never accused 
the steroids back during that steroid era. And I, I mean, whether he did or he didn't, I always felt good for him. The fact that he got out before anybody, you know, had his accusations about him. That's the reason I feel he's in the Hall of Fame right now. And some of the other people like the Rocket Man, uh, Barry Bonds, to, coming up on their last year of uh, eligibility, aren't in the Hall of Fame and probably never will be. I mean, that's in a way that's sad. In a way, I can understand the whole thing, but... I, do, I feel as though the Hall of Fame also should be made into more of a museum. Just an, I, I mean, something that I think where you do have like a steroid era wing or someone like Kurt Schilling gets in there and you can explain his political views weren't what the Hall of Fame really enjoyed and, you know, he had some questionable business decisions, etc. But I think these people do deserve mention in there. Will you think I'm crazy when I say that? No, I mean, it, I'm a voter, and it's it's a nightmare, I think, because, you know, you got to be on one side or the other, and, and no matter what you do, you're a jackass, and I, I've, I've been, it's, it's, I dread the ballot now, and I mean, because you got to, you know, you've already referenced it, but Bonds and Clemens, they're coming on that thing for the last time this year, if they don't get in, and if they don't get in, then, then the Hall of Fame is without the greatest hitter and the greatest pitcher of their generation, yeah. by far. I mean, they're both top five, you look at the numbers, they're both top five at their position of all time. I mean, Roger Clemens is one of the greatest five pitchers of all time, and Bonds as a hitter. There's no question. Just look at the numbers. Yep. So you get the other thing, and, and yeah, I mean, well, you're right. It would be nice to just be able to honor the baseball and not get into the thing. And, I mean, I, I wasn't the one who decided we had to impose all this other stuff, but people have been kept out because of it. And it's just a nightmare. And I think one thing is as people get older or as, as old guys like me die off and the younger voters, they, they're much less punitive about that and more just big haul guys and, and let them all in. And I think that the problem is going to be that eligibility clause that, that you get 10 years in the ballot, and then you go away forever. Then you, yep. then you turn over to the veterans committees and it's even harder to get through them because those old bastards don't want anybody in. They, yeah. they just want to keep it to themselves. And, and uh, so it's going to be tough for Roger and Barry if they don't get in this year. And I don't think they're going to, and it's just a, it's not a good feeling. I mean, because, because I know how great they were and I know they, they, they didn't need that stuff to, to be greater they had enough going, but you know, it's like if you cheat on the masters in the 18th hole in the fourth day, you, you lose because of the cheating, not because you didn't need the strokes. And that's, that's what we're, that's what those guys are facing right now. And it's, it's rough. Barry Bonds, I mean, legitimately, before he had the, um, we'll say, physical transformation, yeah. uh, Barry Bonds was an amazing, I mean, he was an amazing baseball player. He was already an MVP. Yeah, yeah he was already an MVP. It's it, a joke, you know, how good he was. Excellent outfielder as well, too. A lot of people yep. uh, discount the fact that the man had a great arm and could also cover a lot of fields. He was a great baseball player before that, and anybody that has any interest in baseball whatsoever, I don't even have to tell them about Roger Clemens' accomplishments. I mean, I know the Rocket Man wasn't happy with my show when we had uh, Brian McNamee on, but um, I know that you know. Bottom <laughs> line, <laughs> bottom line is the man is one of the greatest pitches to ever throw a baseball, and I feel like the Hall of Fame would be getting a disservice to not have them in there. Correct? I mean, would you agree with me in that in, in some form? Yeah, I know. It, it, I think you know. I think it's going to something like what you're talking about will eventually happen. It's, it's just, it's just. I mean, again, nothing against. It's ridiculous to have a Hall of Fame with with Andre Dawson's in and, and Barry Bonds is not in, or uh, you know Bill Mazeroski's in and Barry Bonds isn't in. I mean, it's just like you know Trevor Hoffman's in, but Roger Clemens isn't. I mean, yes. What are we talking about here? Yes, and, and you know, like I said, if you don't consider them Hall of Famers, their accomplishments should be in there. But that's a discussion for another day because before yeah. we went to break, big man, right? We were talking about you brought up uh, some joking going on with Danny Ainge, and here's here's something that you've educated me on that I was unaware of is that the Celtics had, I was unaware that the Celtics had a court battle. Speaking of baseball and Rocket Roger Clemens, but with the Toronto Blue Jays for Danny Ainge, and I had no clue about this. This is something that you uh, do touch on in the book, ladies and gentlemen. So if you want to find out about this, you can go to the book and read about it. But tell me this, right? You educated me on this during this book. That is an amazing story that I actually did not know existed. Well, yeah. I mean, Danny was just such a great athlete and he was playing in the big leagues while he was still um, playing basketball at BYU. He was able to do both at the same time because they, they, they changed those eligibility rules with professionalism and all that stuff. And you could play a different sport even if you were a professional in another sport. So he had both going on, and uh, and then Toronto said they would allow him, you know, to to pursue his basketball at the college level. But then when he got, nobody would draft him because he he was going to be he was in Major League Baseball. But then Red, being Red, figured I'll take him with a second round pick. What do I got to lose? 
So he takes him with a second round pick and Danny Ainge, all of a sudden he sees the Larry Bird Celtics and he's thinking, yeah, that that's for me. I, just because it was Larry Bird. It was also labor stuff going on with baseball in 1981. It was an ugly time. And those two things convinced Ainge that he wanted to switch from MLB to, uh, to pro basketball, but the, the Blue Jays had him under contract and they weren't going to give it up. And of course, it's not like he can trade players to a yeah. basketball team. <laughs> so there was that. So yeah, it went to court and money had to be paid and he got his freedom and gave up some things and, and read, you know, got what he wanted, which was every player on this team was, was in one way or another, Red kind of stole them. And yep. like, so anyone could have had Ainge, but no one bother to draft him because no one believed they could convince him to leave Major League Baseball, but Red did, and because he had Larry Bird, he was able to do that. Yeah, and like you said, Red had a Red had a nose for these things, which is amazing. Oh, I, I'd have to say he's probably one of the biggest, um, one of the biggest just characters in Boston Celtics history. I mean, him with the cigar. I mean, not even Boston sports. Let me correct that. Boston sports history. I mean, him yeah. just with the cigar and, I mean, Bill Russell, then the whole bird, you know, the whole 80s, you know, down the line. I mean, this guy, What, like you said, he was a, an excellent, I mean, amazing coach, amazing coach. Excellent GM, though, I mean, because he had a nose for just finding these little uh, basic, you know, you know, these little loopholes where he could steal a Danny Ainge or make a trade and grabs a Robert Parrish. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's got to be, you know, he's got to have basically one of the best resumes in the history of professional sports when it comes to being a GM, wouldn't you say? Yeah, he was just playing ahead of people. Uh, you know, it'd be hard to do now with sophisticated scouting and kind of can't snooker people the way he was able to. It, I don't know, the information wasn't as readily available then, but he had guys around the country who tell him stuff and yeah, get this kid Russell's getting all the rebounds out of San Francisco. Nobody saw a video of him. Nobody saw him play. But, you know, Red saw what his friends were telling him. And obviously they won a lot of games out there. And just and he would figure out ways to, to acquire the guy he wanted. And to the point where he's trading the Ice Capade show to the Rochester Royals so that they don't take Russell with the number one pick. So Red gets to get his number two pick and take Russell at two. And Rochester, in exchange for getting the ice show, takes that Hugo Green from Duquesne, which not a bad player, but he wasn't Bill Russell. No, it, wasn't. it certainly wasn't Bill Russell. And then he goes ahead and drafts in the second round. Right? He drafts a 220, uh, 220 hitter from the Blue Jays. It yeah. turns turns into a, a – basically, I mean, obviously he left the Celtics for a while, but, I mean, basically a Celtics lifer at that point. Yeah. I mean, Ainge has been – I think it's 18 years with the uh, as as the GM, et cetera. That just feels like it flew by, does it not? It does. And, I, you know, I mean, I know they have too many retired numbers – another story but they should put his up there in my view because of his lifetime service for the team i mean yeah so he won two two rings as a player he was a starting guard in my view the greatest team of all time and then you know he he comes back and, and runs the team and gets them another ring as a, as a gm long service uh doing that served him well getting brown and tatum and leaves leaves that behind we'll see where that goes but yep. yeah i just and you know he may be a nba hall of famer when it's over too just for like lifetime achievement career service he's been a head coach he's been a broadcaster he's been a scout he's been a gm I mean, he's been everything there is to be in that league and one of the greatest floppers in the history of uh, nba players too <laughs> man he, he could flop with the best of them back then there wasn't many that could <laughs> that's good yeah lamb beer larry always says lamb beer started all that he hates lamb beer Oh, Lambeer, I'll tell you what, he has a place in everybody's heart. That guy, he was maybe a, the biggest villain in the history of the NBA for everybody but Detroit, but my goodness, was he fun to watch. I mean, you must have enjoyed him, correct? Yeah, you know, Notre Dame kid, and he was the joke on him was his father was the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, and he was the only player in the league who didn't make more money than his dad. So he got teased wow. about that. He was like a scratch golfer, and Larry just hated him. And, uh, you know, Larry always wanted to know if, when they named the All-Stars if Lambie was a reserve because he hated being on the practice bus with them. And, and just uh, he just could not stand him. So that was like Larry's motivation for knowing the All-Star reserves. Is Lambie on there or not? Yeah. And we had to break the news to him if, if Bill was on the team. And he always had the uh, – and then when Bill Lambert got the mask, that just perfected the villain. <laughs> he had that mask on, and it was like – oh my! he was like – legitimately, when you look, he was like the Iron Sheik in wrestling. You just love <laughs> to hate this guy. He was he was entertainment, though, every time he was on the court, right? I mean, everybody hated him. Detroit loved him. And all, all in all, the man was an absolute solid NBA player. 
he was a very good player. Yeah. You know, I mean, hey, you're one of the top 12 in, in the league uh, in your conference on a given year, and he was annual all-star as a, as a backup. And, you know, of course, Parrish hated him, unloaded that you know bunch of punches in the back of his head. <laughs> and, and then, you know, Chief got suspended the next game. It was all, you know, again, the golden days. And, and luckily on this book, Lynn Beer's on the cover. He's, you can't really make him out, but, you know, we got – we got Chief McHale and Larry kind of all boxing them out together. And it's a nice, uh, very good symmetry there and then uh, imagery that we got Bill Lambert in the background of our cover. Definitely. And I'll tell you, the other thing I was going to say about Lambert, right? Like you said, the man, the man made less money than his dad. I mean, dude, clearly, whatever. But the other thing was with him, right? He was, a, I mean, like you said, he was top 12, very underrated because of his shenanigans on the on the uh, court, as well as Dennis Rodman with those teams. You know, they had yeah. a lot of players that a lot of people didn't take very seriously, but could come in there and absolutely kick an ass on the basketball floor. That, that Pistons team was was tough. So, they were tough. I mean, you know, Vinny Johnson was just a rugged guard. Michael. They had Adrian Danley with a scoring machine. It was, you know, I mean, everybody hated Isaiah, of course, and he was a great point guard. So just top to bottom. And Chuck Daly was kind of a playing boy. Casey Jones didn't like Chuck Daly. They he wanted to duke it out with him. Even the coaches wanted to fight each other. It was great. Yep. <laughs> Chief Chief hits him with a three piece and a soda and then you get a uh, one game suspension. <laughs> it's like my goodness, those are the those are the days. Guys, we got to take one last brief break. We got Dan Shaughnessy, legitimately one of the greatest media personalities in Boston sports history. We're coming back with him after this brief message one of our very favorite sponsors, guys. I got to keep the lights on. We'll be right back with you stick around hey guys tonight's episode of the happy hour is brought to you by chili sleep technology chili sleep systems is a game changer Chili's Cool Mesh Pad is the most luxurious sleep system in the industry and is also hydro-powered. This can warm you up on those cold winter evenings or cool you off during a steamy summer night. Oh. Promo code KINGHAP will save you 22% off an entire sleep system. This is certainly a purchase that you will not regret. Our systems can bring the temperature anywhere from 55 degrees to 115 by remote control or the Chili Sleep app. Get over to ChiliTechnology.com and make sure to use promo code KINGHAT to save 22%. And now, back to a man that needs absolutely no help warming it up in between the sheets, your host of the happy hour, King Hap. Oh, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Chili Sleep Technology, guys. Get over to ChiliSleep.com. Promo code KINGHAP saves you 20%. Legitimately, the largest discount that Chili Sleep gives is for you guys, the Happy Hour Social Club. Guys, I can't tell you how tickle pink Chili Sleep is with everybody and all the support that they give them. Guys, keep keep uh, tagging us online with them. They are absolutely eating up the love from the Happy Hour Social Club. And we're back. And like I said, we're one of the biggest, one of the biggest celebrities in Boston media history and I'll tell you Dan you were given the nickname Shank by the 1980 Celtics teams I mean in the 80s they would say this that's because you basically said I mean and, and tell me if I'm wrong you basically said what was on your mind whether it was nice or not and that's just how you did it and I'll tell you what it worked out well because in the end you always had the respect of the people you covered and they always kind of watched their P's and Q's because they knew old Shank would go out there and you know give him the old Shank if you know what I'm saying right I mean that's how that come about correct well you're funny that's a very good way to characterize the, the dynamic i guess you could call it you know larry'd say they i mean it started off a little more affectionately as scoop but then as, as things got a little edgier uh, it's, you know mikhail liked to use shank and they, they, some of them would go to that and you know larry larry'd always point out like if i'd come in the locker room he'd say scoop you ever notice how quiet it gets you walk in here and because <laughs> they knew that if i if i knew something it was going in it was you know like there's no holds barred and and you know again we're not talking about life and death here is basketball and and they were all they were funny guys and they were they were cocky guys and they were very secure in their own skins and that that made it easier to cover them because even if you ripped them a little bit like dj ripped himself hard on anybody you could never criticize dennis johnson because he'd do it himself so, uh, I, I i can't make shots you know just and they were they were just secure enough to be honest enough to not worry about what we were saying or thought for the most part and, but yeah then mikhail took on the, the shank thing he'd be he'd say uh 
the, the, the expression would be like, you're, you're driving a pipe through me, you know, like say, uh, Shanks, your shoulder's sore from driving all those pipes while we were on the road there. <laughs> and, uh, just, just, it was just, it was fun. It was good natured and, and, uh, nobody really, really got mad. It was just, uh, neither them nor me, but they did understand that, you know, we weren't going to be like forever friends. It was going to be, you know, I, I, ultimately I was responsible to tell the readers what, what was going on and what they were like. And if something weren't great, we'd have to bring that on the page as well. Yep, and uh, you touch on DJ in the book, definitely, and I mean, very sad story. I mean, the man had yeah. made maybe the biggest basket in Boston Celtics history. I mean, arguably, I mean, you know, Bird stole the ball. But, I, yeah. I mean, truth be told, Dennis Johnson, very, very tragic story, and everybody here in Boston has a soft spot in their heart for DJ. He just was one of those guys that you couldn't help but like. I mean, you must have felt the same way being around him all the time, correct? I loved him. I mean, he was, from the day he got there, because, you know, he was a little bit intimidating. You know, he had been MVP of the finals and the Western Conference guy and had, you know, Lenny Wilkins buried him, said he was a cancer and all this stuff. So we didn't really know what to expect. And he came in, but they gave him a great reception. They were all teasing about having freckles and a blackout with freckles <laughs> and, and all this stuff. And, and uh, it, they were fun with him. And, it, and he was fun right back. And he was so good. And, um, you know, guy who could guard Andrew Tony could, could bang with magic and, you know, try to deny him a little bit and just a great rebounder and a clutch guy. You wanted him at the line late in the game and he, wasn't a great shooter, but he, he didn't feel pressure. He just, you know, the kid didn't even play high school basketball. He was just a guy who was, gro- you know, bagging groceries and working at a liquor store, and his brothers all played summer ball. And he got discovered after high school, after not going out for his high school basketball team. So, and then he's MVP of the finals for Seattle, like, five years later. It was Unreal. an amazing story and just a terrible, to lose him, it's really tough. I mean, he I, I wish I could have talked to him for this book, because he'd have been great, because we got along great, and and uh, I just, I, I loved him. Everybody did. Yep, and I'll tell you one of the other things. One thing that I always said about DJ, man, is that he looked like, I mean, even watching him handle the ball, he didn't look like a great ball handler, but my goodness, nope. did that man have handle. You couldn't get the yep. ball from him. He used his body fantastically to guide people, keep people away from the ball as he, you know, as he, you know, dribbled and set up plays. The man was, he was he was a magician out there. I No wonder he was uh, so loved by his teammates, too. He seemed like he had a great attitude, and I mean, truth be told, very, very sad that, you know, we lost him so soon and i bet you he would have been amazing for quotes and stuff for this book oh I, yeah because he, he really he was in on all the jokes and, and he, again just a very secure he knew how good he was and uh it was just heartbreaking for everybody god he died in 2007 that's man, that's a long time ago now i can't believe they don't have him Yep, it seems like it was yesterday. It does. Yeah. It, it, a lot of these things do. Like I said, with Ainge coming on as the uh, GM and the president, all it, it's like wow, time flies in NBA years and in life. But one of the other things I wanted to say, uh, I wanted to touch on real quick before we had to, before we have to let you go. This book does bring to light the fact that this 1980s Celtics teams all basically gelled together and almost were like a family on the road. They seemed like they were just a really fun team to cover, and they also seemed like they were absolutely a tight-knit group. Some of the people ended up not getting along great at the end or whatever, but I guess if you could talk about a team getting along and basically gelling together, the old, I know the old uh, you know 12 guys, 12 cabs thing definitely didn't, uh, didn't no. you know pertain to this squad, correct? No, they, they, they helped each other because I, you know, I went on to baseball when I left the beat in 86 and it was startling to walk into the Red Sox clubhouse and just see this pack of individuals who are grumpy and sensitive. And, and Bruce Hurst, he has this very elegant and just, um, characterization of this in the book that he talks about because he knew those Celtics because he was good friends with Ainge. He had lived in Ainge's house for a while and, you know, they were both Mormons and they were from the West and, and of course, he they, they both played big league baseball, so he was really tight with Ainge. He'd come to Celtic practice. He loved basketball, and he couldn't believe the dynamic and how they did get on each other. But it was never personal, and it was and they they could tease each other and have these competitive practices, and it was never personal. And and, and you know, get ripped by the media and not overreact, and just he just saw a huge difference in the sport and and the dynamic of of that team versus the team he was on, and of course being a reporter covering both, I certainly saw it and felt it immediately when I went on baseball. I'm like, oh man, this might have been a mistake. I used to be having a great time covering those guys. This isn't going to be any fun. And it really wasn't. 
And, and I can I can see that. And everybody who picks up this book is gonna actually get that. Like I said, it's almost like it's almost like I took a couple hour vacation back to the eighties <laughs> reading this book. And I'll tell you, it was fantastic on my way to Vegas. And the the best part about it is I I couldn't you know as I finished up my vacation, one of the things I was looking forward to the most was getting back on the plane to go ahead and finish the book out. This this is one of those ones, guys. You're gonna pick up. You ain't gonna be able to put down. One last thing I gotta touch on, big man, and then we'll hit last call uh, real quick. I mean. Cedric Maxwell's touched on the book a lot. He must have made this book. I'm sure you must have gotten a lot from Ced. He is like, Max is like one of those guys. He was always making up the nicknames, joking with people. And one of the things in this book, I got to tell I won't go deep into it because I don't want to give away too much. But I mean, they talk about the MVPs getting all this stuff. And he felt (laughs) slighted when he got his MVP. And I'll tell you, that was one thing I was like, I got to finish reading this. You know, the plane and land. I'm like, let me get back to this here. You know, but I mean, the man gets, you know, I mean, all these people getting cars and all this stuff. The man gets it. The man gets a Seiko watch for winning MVP. Oh my God, he must have been livid. <laughs> they make they make him go to New York to accept his prize, and and you know he figures it's going to be a sports car when he comes out of the the luncheon to honor him. And he comes out and there's a cab waiting for him. They've given him a Seiko watch, like you say. <laughs> oh my, he God. still has it. He. He'd bring it out and show it to Tatum and Brown. Those guys are like, this is what we used to get for MVP, you know, for the NBA as sponsors and all that stuff. Says, I got a freaking watch, man. I got screwed. I got Jack. <laughs> so oh. he's, he's hilarious about it. If you ever see him, bring it up. He loves talking about it. Oh, my God. And you know what? He's a, he's such a character on the air and everything else. The man, I mean, his teammates loved him. I, I, I heard that there was some uh, button heads with Bird or whatever. But, I mean, truth truth is, is that he spent a lot of years here in Boston. And, I mean, he's another Boston lifer. And I'll tell you, he's one of those guys that will never be forgotten in Boston sports as well. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, Max was clutch. You know, he was, he was great with us because he was a quote machine, but he was clutch, you know. He's MVP of the finals in 81, the first one Bird won. And then he's MVP of Game 7, the greatest series ever against the Lakers in 84. He scored 24 in that game. Was his high point total for the year was in the seventh game of the NBA Finals. I and mean, that's the kind of player he was. Yep. And when people go on, now guys, today is the day that we're dropping this book. Wish it lasted forever. Life with the Larry Bird Celtics. When you go on Amazon, pick that up. And if I can give you another piece of advice, I'd also grab uh, one of Dan's other New York Times bestsellers is uh, Frank Kona, the Red Sox years. I know that you wrote that book with Terry. And, and truth be told, he kind of got a little bit of a schmear campaign leaving the, leaving the town. Yeah. But uh, what a good guy Terry was and what a great book you wrote there. And I wanted to make sure I gave you a little uh, touch of credit on that one so when everybody goes to Amazon to go ahead and order wish it lasted forever they can go ahead and grab Frank Conner as well what a great book for all Red Sox fans correct thank you very much Mike it's been a pleasure hanging out with you here and enjoying the program and I hope everybody's enjoyed listening to us uh, going back and forth on the golden days yes sir guys that brings us to last call we're here with Dan Shaughnessy ladies and gentlemen last call as always brought to you by Clearwater Distillery the official top shelf alcohol the happy hour social club and the absolute most delicious small batch alcohol on planet earth today promo code king hap on the website saves you 10% all orders over $100 the new the new scandalous uh, cinnamon whiskey is out guys you gotta get over there and give that a try I- I'm telling you what our friends at Clearwater have really outdone themselves and I appreciate them sponsoring last call Dan it's last call we're here on the happy hours with the happy hours social club members where can they find you online and also where can they go ahead and pick up wish it lasted forever life with the Larry Bird Celtics well I know Amazon's a good call these days you get you know to go out shopping so uh, Amazon.com wish it lasted forever life with the Larry Bird Celtics and Every bookstore should have it starting today. If there's a bookstore in your neighborhood, support them. We love to support those local booksellers, and, and the book should be in good stock there. And if it's not, yell at them and tell them to order more. Yeah, we need to, we need Dan's books. And I'll tell you, Dan, if everybody wants to go ahead, anybody here from the Happy Hour Social Club wants to give you a follow, see what you're doing now and what you what, what kind of uh, what kind of stuff uh, Shank's stirring up, where can they follow you on social media? So I'm on Twitter. It's uh, Dan underscore Shaughnessy. I, I guess that's how it works. But you just type my name out. I got the blue check. I got the blue check. So I'm, I'm on there. So, yeah, Twitter's the one uh, for me because I don't, I don't do Facebook. And I'm kind of an old guy. It doesn't really – not a lot of platforms for me. But Boston Globe is the, the mothership. And uh, Twitter, I can be found there as well. Absolutely, guys. I'll tell you what. I'm, I, I want to just go ahead and give you a quick thank you, Dan, for coming on the show. I'm honored to have you. The Happy Hour Social Club members are absolutely thrilled. And everybody, make sure you pick that book up. And when you do, 
go ahead and give it a tag online. Let Dan know where you go. You know, you heard about it here on the happy hour. And we're going to go ahead and let Dan know that we're giving him some love and everybody, the most loyal listeners and fans in the world. I, I show Dan some good, show him some goddamn love, ladies and gentlemen. Dan, what I'm going to do now is I want to, I'm obviously going to go ahead and let you go, but I want to, like I said, thank you again for coming on the show. I appreciate you being so generous with your time. And on top of it all, the day of the release of the book, you're here at the happy hour social club. Thank you, sir. We really appreciate that. Thank you, Mike. Take care. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, and here it is. We're going to leave you with the happy hour from Abyss version two, ladies and gentlemen. Good night. We love you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Abyss. Happy hour. Happy hour. AbyssHipHop.com. Hey. Sports fanatics applauding at the matches. Picking winners while we sift through the brackets. Yeah. Turf green like a bag of sour. We gotta talk of that podcast is the happy hour. Meta come to the game fully geared. Who would dare? Been beast most since the rookie years. Yeah. Little fact for the lightning round. This is Title Town, the place where all of the fires found. We attend games on a regular. Heard more goals than a motivation seminar. Yeah. Stay charged like a visa. So many bad calls. No, we stop it by the most bleachers. So click play and just soak it up. This is happy hour, but not the same as your local pub. Sports talk, hit the pro shows a must. Let's go like the page called the happy hour social club. Boss moves, so you know your boy paid them dues. Front row, you can see us through the pay-per-view. Fights on, watching them box like big parcels. The MMA know that the art is mixed martial. Listen, guests, you better play your best. You playing fast, you better go take a breath and just play the bench. Uh, clap hard with these two hands. You've been true fans, you're stats off the newsstand. Yeah.